with kids, particularly where behavior is, you know, bumpy, we'll call it that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's so much parental energy and how do we control, how do we control, how do we control a kid's behavior? When of course our goal is really how do we, how do we help them develop self-control? And you know, the, the challenge of course is it, 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 it tends to be messy before it's less messy. In a world where autonomy is key to motivation and engagement, how do we navigate this with our children, especially those who are neurodivergent? Today, we're exploring the vital role of independence and control in fostering engagement and motivation, not just in kids, but in all of us. Joining us to talk about all of these topics is Ned Johnson, founder of Prep Matters and co-author of The Self-Driven Child and What Do You Say? How to Talk to Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a Happy Home. That's straight ahead on episode 206. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. A couple of months ago, we launched the Neurodiversity University Educator Hub. This is a community where educators dedicated to supporting neurodivergent learners can connect, learn, and share. I've had so much fun getting to know some of you from all over the world through our roundtable conversations, one-on-one -on -one consultations, and message board threads. We're going to be opening up the Educator Hub for registration again this month, so if you want to make sure that you don't miss out on the window to sign up, be sure to click the link in the show notes so you are the first to be notified. We would love to have you join us. Okay, my conversation with Ned Johnson is up next. When I found the Neurodiversity Podcast, I was really kind of... Desperate to learn about myself and understand myself. Honestly, I wanted to find like a tribe who I could relate to and feel like I fit in. This podcast brings on guests who seem to be moving neurodiversity more into the mainstream. And Emily Kircher Morris is amazing. I feel like she's talking straight to me. Her knowledge about people who think differently is so refreshing. Everyone's different. And the world needs to understand them. And that's what the neurodiversity podcast is doing. Helping them understand us. 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 Today, I'm chatting with Ned Johnson. Ned is the founder of Prep Matters and co-author of the books, The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives, and What Do You Say? How to Talk with Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a Happy Home. He is also the host of The Self-Driven Child podcast. So Ned, welcome. Well, thank you, Emily. I am so happy to be with you today. So I love this conversation about autonomy. It is such an integral part of feeling engaged and motivated. So that's kind of where I thought it would be a good place for us to start our conversation. Um, I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about why having a sense of independence or control is such a vital component related to feeling engaged and motivated, um, not just for kids, but for all of us. Well, it's a great question, Th and I appreciate that. You know, so my writing partner, I'll back up, my writing partner, Bill Stickshoot, is a clinical neuropsychologist, and he spent <clears throat> 40 years working with kids where learning was hard or self-regulation was hard, attention, behavior, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I'm a test prep geek, and so I help kids who are, are often kind of overly motivated, right, sort of, you know, obsessively driven. <laughs> and we were, we were lecturing for a while about how is it that teens become, how do we motivate kids or how do they motivate themselves as perhaps more, uh, more on point. And somewhere along the line, Bill said, it seems to me it might be worth writing down some of the things that we think that are useful to kids. He said, does it feel to you like there's an organizing principle? And I said, it feels to me like everything that we suggest, at least that I'm suggesting to kids, really increases their perceived sense of control. So, you know, sleep and technology and, and you know, self-talk and da-da-da-da-da. And when we did this kind of deep dive on it, it turns out it's everywhere in the, in the mental health literature and the, in the health literature. I mean, people who, who have more choices when they're in a nursing home live longer than if they don't. Mm. And it was so important to us because we thought that we were seeing, we were writing this in 2015, 
what looked like two epidemics back when epidemics were not yet cool, um, <laughs> of, of uh, stress-related disorders, of anxiety and depression and all the bad things that come from that self-injury, substance use, on and on and on. And what looked to us like disordered motivation, either kids who are obsessively driven, who would, who would sacrifice their health and their happiness, their integrity, did it up for that perceived you know, brass ring, or kids who are saying, well, if I can't be top 10%, I'll never have a successful life. Why, why, even, why even bother? And we thought, holy cow. And for both of those things, for stress tolerance, a low sense of control is the most stressful thing that you can experience. And there's a wonderful researcher named Sonia Lubian who says you can summarize what's stressful to anyone with the acronym of NUT. So N, N is novelty, not just the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus. Hey, <laughs> uh, U is unpredictability. So college admissions, traffic, all that good stuff. T, perceived threat. Most of us before COVID, <clears throat> I can kill you with that. Emily, it's really, you know, am I cool enough? And do people think I'm a dope? You know, do, am, I, am I smart enough? On and on it goes. And then S is a low sense of control. And it turns out a low sense of control is the most stressful thing that we can experience. So we can handle new situations. We can even handle perceived threat so long as we feel like there's something that we can do there. And then from a motivational perspective, we lean really heavily. Our North Star is what's called self-determination theory. And it's a model of motivation. And for people who don't know, there are kind of two big branches of this. Extrinsic, sticks and carrots, hey, woo, give me that sticker chart, love those things to a point. Or intrinsic motivation, where not, it's not about getting kids to work hard, but helping them want to work hard. Um, because that's the magic, the secret sauce that we really want to try to wire into kids' brains. And Self-determination theory holds that there are three psychological needs that need to be met. One is the perceived sense of competency. I'm, I'm, I don't have to be the best, but I, I want to feel like I'm not utterly incompetent. Two, a sense of relatedness. And three, a sense of autonomy. And when we spoke with Edward D.C., one of the guys who put this together decades ago, we said, it seems to us that of the three of these, the most important is, is autonomy. Do I have that right? And he said, yeah, you got that right. So that's the case for the sense of autonomy or sense of control. And it's this perceived sense of autonomy, and importantly, we may nerd out on this later, the brain state that supports it, meaning your prefrontal cortex with all those executive functions kind of runs the show, including regulating the amygdala, the, the, the threat-detecting part of our brains. You know, I love that you bring up self-determination theory of motivation because it is my preferred theory of motivation, as geeks like us have, right? As one does. And one of the things, you mentioned the intrinsic and extrinsic pieces of motivation. And one of the pieces that I really love about that particular theory that I think maybe our audience would also enjoy learning about just a little bit is how they break down intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Because I think a lot of people believe that it is a binary. Mm -hmm. It's either intrinsically motivated or it's extrinsically motivated, and it's not. And I find that with my work with young people, really being very explicit and helping them understand how that can vary for them also empowers them. But can you talk a little bit about the various ways that we can conceptualize that that motivation? Yeah. I mean, I think the easiest way to think about this is um, with extrinsic motivators, we can use them in ways that are controlling and we can use them in ways that are autonomy supporting. So I was just doing an, an interview the other week and, and this, um, the, the hostess was, she, the hostess saying that she, when, <laughs> when she was writing, oh gosh, it was like her dissertation or something like this. And she w lined up like, I don't know, like 30 jelly beans. I can't remember. It was something like that. <laughs> and every time she wrote one page, she would eat one of these things. And, you know, people, when I finish the thing, I'm going to go on vacation or I'm going to buy those concert tickets or those cool shoes or whatever it happens to be. And we use this to drive ourselves forward because dopamine, that get up and go, hey, let's focus on things, get your brain maximally activated, is the neurotransmitter that's released in the anticipation of reward, right? So I, you know, get up and run in the morning and then I'm looking forward to a really good cup of coffee thereafter. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking, the anticipation, hey, gets me going. So the key thing is when we use extrinsic motivators, we want to make sure that we use them in ways, we, we introduce them to kids as a tool, not trying to coerce them. So one of my favorite stories of, of the last month, <laughs> I'm working with this kid. Oh, he's complicated. He's ADHD. He's got learning disabilities. He's anxious. He's depressed. I mean, he's a sweet kid, but golly, he's having a run of it. He has an older sister who, although I love her to pieces, was really poorly mattered in that she ran off to Penn so that's a tough act to follow, right? 
And so what I'm watching is this kid who is struggling and among other things, wildly sleep deprived. And I can't tell you how much test prep money gets paid to me that I then used to <laughs> talk to kids about sleep. <laughs> so I'm making the case and I'm making the case and I'm making the case. And what I always would ask kids is, you know, hey, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, could you get in bed by 1030 rather than 1230, whatever it is? And if they say no, so well, okay, well, I won't worry about it then. But if they say, then I say, what stands in your way? And I won't go through the whole conversation, but I basically end up with, you know, if it would help you, it'd be help you. I'd be, I'd be willing to offer you an incentive, you know, take Ned's money, call it a game, right? <laughs> if, if it would help you get in bed, because I get that when you're ADHD or anxious and depressed, you just don't have enough dopamine kicking around your head. And so long story short, I end up peeling off for this kid five $20 bills. I get a, a report back, hey, how did the test go? I stayed awake through the whole thing. I'm like, dude, that's a great way to start the SAT. And he went up almost 200 points. And I could have, or his mom, or loving mom, or anyone could have, been like, dude, you got to get these scores up. You got to get these scores up and just add more fear. And that's not what he needed to be motivated. So when it's sticker charts, you know, it's and, and, and cookies and whatever, even just, hey, add a boy kind of thing. We want to make sure that we, we do this in a way that is supporting their time and say, if it would help, you know, or you, you, may, you may find you might want to do this a little bit more if you got something to look forward to. Um, so often, you know, if you do this, I'll give you that. And it's just, it's not quite the right energy mm -hmm. because it's coercive. Yeah. I feel like that's such a subtle difference mm -hmm. because we're supporting them. We're offering the tool, but they're in charge of it. Like that to me is kind of the, the the difference. Like they have the autonomy to make the choice to engage with that as opposed to if you don't do this, then this consequence happens or or there's this thing that you really want or need, but I'm not going to, I'm going to withhold it until. And that's the thing that sometimes even about like positive rewards is that the, the loss of the reward is a punishment. Yep. It's still got that coercive piece to it. That's right. I mean, I was working with this kid a couple of years ago who was, oh, he's such a neat kid, super bright, but so depressed and taking medical leave. I mean, just, it was, it was hard. And his parents were, I mean, they lovely people, but they were so controlling in ways that was hard, that were hard for them to see. And he was really in danger of, of bombing a bunch of classes, flunking classes, and all the bad things, the alleged bad things that would come from that. And so dad said to me, so I told him, you know, if you get all this work done by Saturday, you know, I'll take you to the Knicks game or whatever it was. And I said, I said, I love that you're trying to incentivize your kid and help him get over this hump. I said, if I may, and this is to your point, Emily, if I may, I would do that a little bit differently because now he could be fearing if I don't do well, not only am I going to get bad grades, my parents can be unhappy with me, I'm going to be unhappy with me, but I don't get to go to that game. I said, if we're me, I might consider saying, hey, kiddo, I hope we can get all this stuff done. But, you know, what I want to let you know, I bought tickets for the game. So, you know, a week after all this foolishness is done, one way or another, we'll go to that game. And, you know, and, and again, because dopamine is released in the anticipation of reward, when we have something in front of us, and I, I say this for, for kids in, about kids in school, that it helps enormously if every kid has something that he or she looks forward to in the school day, right? I get through this dreary history class and then I get this island of fun singing in the, in the choir. This was me in high school anyway. Um, and it gets me through because it's that anticipation of it, right? Um, in the same way that when we think about vacation, half of the cognitive benefits is the anticipation of, hey, Thanksgiving coming. Um, and so if parents can, can do this and just take note of it, if they feel like you're trying to get your kid to do something, your kid probably feels it too. I have a, a client who I've been working with. He is um, a college student at this point, and he is very bright. He's gifted, twice exceptional. He's autistic. He's ADHD, lots of emotional dysregulation. I've been working with him for years, and we, mm -hmm. ha we have made a lot of progress in some areas. But one of the areas that's really has been difficult is just work completion. You know, he's taking some classes at the community college and, and um, the other piece is just stopping. He calls it a rage spiral when he gets in a rage spiral, but <laughs> stopping his video games when he starts to get elevated. And it was so interesting in the past when we've come up with ideas, I, I've tried to suggest some of those things like, what could you reward yourself with? What mm. would be an incentive that you would then? 
And his whole thing has always been, well, it won't work because I know I'll just do it right away. I'll just, I'm too impulsive. I can't, I can't, (laughs) I can't withhold whatever that thing is for myself. And so Mm -hmm. we've tried some different things, but recently it was so interesting. So basically he's playing this video game and he gets in these rage spirals, but part of it is that he keeps playing until he gets really, really stressed out. And then he, then he can't pull it back. Right. So then he's like, ends up rage quitting the game, whatever. But we were talking about this and we were trying to figure out a way that he could regulate this himself. And so what we came up with was he was going to set a timer on his phone for every 10 minutes. And every 10 minutes, he was just going to check in with himself. How am I feeling on a scale of one to five? And if it's a three or a four, we're going to take a break. But the other interesting thing about this is the way that this game is structured, because you're playing live with other people, Mm. if you leave the game in the middle... There's a consequence there. You then can't join again. But that was actually finally a tool that worked for him because he didn't want to get kicked out. He knew that that check-in was going to help him then re-regulate so he could stay in the game. And and it finally, it was like a thing that he could implement on his own without all of these other pieces. But it was so em- empowering for him to finally feel like there was a way that he could implement that, <laughs> either the reward or the consequence, but do it on his own without his parents sitting there and threatening him or just trying to like guide him every step of the way. Like I said, he's a college age student. And so, um, but it is, it is interesting, but it just takes time sometimes, I think, to get to that point. It really does. And, and you know, I, I love the, the way you're going to working with this boy to sort of flexibly, well, well let's, let's give this one a try and then let's give that one a try. And, and the challenge, of course, is for any you know parents who are listening is is you have a pretty clear idea on what works for you and just assume that it works for other people mm, right yeah we project that <laughs> yeah yeah it can be and it can be hard um and you know it, you, i think you probably live in this space even more than do i that with kids particularly where behavior is you know bumpy we'll call it that mm-hmm. <laughs> i think there's so much parental energy and how do we control how do we control how do we control a kid's behavior when of course our goal is really how do we how do we help them develop self control, and you know the the challenge of course is it it it, it tends to be messy before it's less messy. Mm. Um, and uh, what's interesting for me is the rage quitting or you know the the av- anxious avoidance. I mean, all of these things are there are are stress systems that are overwhelmed. And when as I, as a parent, or as a teacher, or administrator, whatever, go in and try to start controlling kids, by definition, I'm increasing their stress because I'm decreasing their, their healthy sense of control. And then we get more bad behavior and then we clamp down on more and you're like, this is, you know, okay, pick up Ross Green, everybody, because you know where this is going <laughs> to explode into. So uh, I, I'm curious, how do you respond to parents who feel like this is just permissive parenting? You're just letting kids do whatever. You're letting them have too much control. <laughs> well, first of all, I, you know, I, it's always important to validate, right? And so, I, you know, with parents, I say, you know, obviously, obviously you want only the best for your kid. I mean, you love him from the top of his head to bottom of his toes. Um, I will typically then talk a little bit about, you know, the parenting models of authoritarian, which is a pretty terrible method. The only one that's worse is lazy fair because then kids feel like nobody's looking out for them or cares them or gives them boundaries, but that in-between space of authoritative. And the challenge is there's probably a whole spectrum within there. When I feel like I have the courage and I'm feeling a little saucy, <laughs> I can, I'll just simply say, so, well, so tell me what you're doing right now. So h- how's that working for you? Right. And, you know, I've told him a million times. So the millionth and first, that'll be the one that lands. So if you indulge me, I'll tell the story. I was working with a kid still working with a kid. Uh, whose older sister, very academic, went off to some, you know, highly rejective college, as they say. Uh, this kid, things are harder. He's ADHD. He's anxious. He's depressed. It's complicated. And I get an email from dad. Oh, I remember they they started with me in eighth grade. And if I could meet with him and talk him into getting a neuropsychological evaluation. Mm-hmm. And as my friend Bill would say, we we don't believe in talking kids into things. We believe in talking with them about them. Because when, when we're not coercive, they're much more likely to let their guard down and say, maybe you got a point there, dad. Um, so I get this email from dad. <laughs> I'm wondering if we could have a conversation. I've decided to withdraw all support to my son. Okay. Okay, <laughs> right. I'd love to talk with you, but if I may, what kind of support have you been giving? 
So we hop on the call and he says, well, I, I remind him to do his homework. Okay. So how, 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 many, how often do you remind him to do his homework? Well, not that much. I mean, maybe four or five times a day. It's my wife who's really on top of him all the time. Like, okay. So he's home from sports like 6.30, 7 o'clock. You know, you guys go to bed at 11 o'clock. So in those four, four and a half hours, he gets reminded 12 to 15 times, which is what, like every 15 or 20 minutes? How's that working for you? I didn't actually say it, but that was in the back of my head. <laughs> and keep him when this guy's a, a, a high-level business consultant. I'm like, okay. And I said, may, may I offer you, may I offer you a, 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 a suggestion? And I use that language all the time, parents, kids, everyone else, because it gives them a sense of control. They say, no, I don't really want to hear. Okay, fine. And he says, sure. And I said, let me, have, let me suggest you try this. When your son comes home, ask him, hey, do, do you got a plan for what you need to get done tomorrow? ADHD kids oftentimes don't have plans. He says, I do, I do. And then I make, I make him show me the plan. I said, respectfully, just ask, does he have a plan? If he says yes, trust him. If he says no, offer, you're helping, helping him make one. He's looking at me like, really? I said, okay, step two, once he ostensibly has a plan, ask, is there anything on that plan that I can help with? He said, that's it? I said, no, no, last thing is then ask because you won't be able to help yourself. You're gonna, you're gonna circle back because you will, because you're a loving dad, I get it, and your kid's ADHD last time I checked. I said, ask, is it okay if I circle back in a couple hours just to see if there's anything I can help you with? Not to say, have you gotten your work done? Don't, please don't do that. He said, that's it? I said, just, just try it, see what happens. I get an email from him later that night. It may have been your advice or maybe just the weather or something, but <clears throat> we, uh, so we tried that and we had, a, we had the best conversation we've had in a year possibly ever about his schoolwork. Yeah. And what I remind myself and try to remind everyone is that kids want to be successful. They want their lives to work out. And because their work is generally school, he doesn't want to go to school and be unsuccessful. But this kid was staying up and doing his homework between like two, or five, two and five o'clock in the morning when he was finally, his parents had gone to bed, he'd watched enough YouTube and said, I really should get this stuff done. And so, so much of this, if you go back to your extrinsic versus intrinsic, is simply how do we change the energy in ways. And, you know, this is a kid who, I mean, for kids who have ADHD or they're anxious or depressed or they're ASD or are dyslexic or on and on it goes, they need help. Learning is harder for you if you have a learning disability. It's kind of in the, <laughs> the name there, right? And so kids need more support. But what so often happens is they, particularly in the early years, it's, I think it's so often done, so much support is given to kids, but in a way that can feel to them like this is being done to them, not with them or for them. And then because these psychological needs for autonomy, this isn't based on, neurodiverge, on, on neurotypical people. Some of these things are, I mean, you can, you can apply this, some of this is based on rodents, right? I mean, it goes all the way, it goes all the way down. Um, so anyway, it was, that was, I, I was quite pleased by, by dad. He, he was open to making a shift and it made, it just, it, it completely changed the energy in, in their house. I am sure that a major part of what that dad is experiencing is anxiety driven. Like that's, he's coming from a place of his own anxiety. Mm -hmm. He loves his kid. Yeah, absolutely. And wants him to do well and wants him to be successful. And depending on what he went through as a child and what type of support he did or didn't have, that influences everything. But when it comes to parenting kids, especially neurodivergent kids, we have to kind of be aware of that for ourselves, our own emotions and our own stresses. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if you have some thoughts about some things that parents can do to kind of maybe model that self-regulation or do some things like what are some of the pieces that you see that are really re effective for parents to implement in their own lives? Yeah, I mean, I, th I th you know, certainly the most powerful tool in the parenting toolbox is, is modeling, is modeling. Um, and so, first of all, you, you, you can't credibly ask of someone else that which you're not prepared to do yourself. So get yourself on out of your bedroom, okay? <laughs> Start with you, mom and dad. Mm. I think it's really useful. My emphasis is always really on, on stress and what brings stress into or out of families. Uh, and so one thing would be, particularly for little guys and even for in high school, is to articulate your thinking, sharing your emotions, because... Teenagers especially are really, really good at picking up on feelings, especially negative ones, in adults 
and they're terrible at decoding them. Mm. So the paradigm work that's done, they put people my age, I'm an old guy in case you guys can't tell, and, and teenagers in front of computers and they show them pictures of faces. And teenagers are like, he's angry, she's angry, he's angry, she's angry, they're angry, everyone's angry. <laughs> <laughs> Where someone who's a bit older will be, oh, they're frustrated, mm -hmm. right? They're anxious, they have an upset stomach and all these shades of gray. And it, it has to do with, with the nucleus accumbens gets up, turned up during adolescence. And so we just become super sensitive to, to the feelings and faces of people around us, but we just don't explain them very well. Um, or they don't decipher them very well. And particularly if, if you've got a kid who's ASD, who classically, they, they see it, they feel, but they, they're just, they're also even more so not sahad at reading what's going on. So what I would do with my daughter, and I could press her buttons like nobody's business and she could do it back to me. And we just, and it was hard because I, I mean, I just love this kid. But when I, we, we get, we just get each other going a bit. And someone, you know, someone who's coaching me said, you have to really be super clear. And this is before we knew she was autistic, by the way. When you get mad, Ned, you're kind of intense, <laughs> which, which is fair, which is fair, you know? And I work really hard not to get mad, but, but sometimes I do. And so what I would do, I, I would say, you know, Katie, I'm, I'm really upset right now. I'm not upset at you. I'm just really, really frustrated with this. And I'm not quite sure what I should be saying. So I'm gonna go away for a half an hour. I'm just gonna go walk and I'm gonna think. I'm not mad at you. And I'd have to say it like three times because otherwise she felt like the whole world was her. Like she, she's just sensitive that everything was wrong in the world was somehow her fault. It's just how she's wired. And I said, is it, is it cool if I, if I circle back in, in a while? And because otherwise she would just sit there and stew and think that I was so, that I was mad at her. And so I say this because it's not reasonable, I think, for me to expect to myself that I never get upset by anything. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that's a reasonable expectation that any of us can have. But when you're really upset, to just explain to your kid, I'm really upset about this. And, and but I'm, you know, it's really about the situation. I'm not mad at you, but I, I do want to, I would like to talk this through. And there's come back around later. Um, sort of in that vein, we talk, we have a concept we borrowed from a, a guy um, called the concept of being a non-anxious presence. And it's simply that stress is wildly contagious. And so if your kid is spun up, you're likely to get spun up in response. And if you're angry, they'll, you'll make them, on and on it goes, right? Um, and so we do better helping kids, particularly kids who are a little dysregulated, if we can move in the direction of being less anxious. So I am perhaps the most well-rested person in DC. It's literally on my <laughs> cell phone, 10, 15 bedtime for now until I you know, get a new phone. Um, I exercise daily and I practice something called transcendental meditation, partly because I know when I'm angry, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not, the, I'm not the easiest person to live with as a, as a husband, as a dad. Um, and I get there because I had really intense depression as a, as a teen and I'm just vulnerable. And for men, anxiety and depression often flares out as anger. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to do that because I'm not very effective at anything that matters to me. So, um, you know, people lump this under self-care, which it is, but like your student, you know, checking in on himself every 10 minutes and say, how am I feeling, right? For me, when the work that I do with test prep, every once in a while, I can feel myself getting really impatient with a kid. And I just don't do that very often. It's like, oh, interesting. What's going on there? And what do I need to be doing more of or less of to do that? Because if the inflows of stress into your body or family or um, community aren't balanced by healthy outflows, you can expect every kind of bad thing in the world. Um, so, you know, if you really want to help your kids, particularly ones who have just more complicated brains and therefore more complicated nervous systems, it's not always obvious to people that one of the most helpful things that they can do is to really try to move in this direction of being, of being a non-anxious presence. Um, and it's funny, you know, my wife and I, <laughs> my kids are both now in college, but we had uh, about a year and a half episode when my, when, well, as my wife would say, my son's situation was easy. He had a brain tumor. It was a year and a half of treatment. He's better now. Very easy story. My daughters take several paragraphs, all of which I won't go into. But it was it was a ride. Mm -hmm. It was a ride. And we really had to think very purposefully about if we want to help our kids, what are the things that we need to be doing? Because if I, you know, 
flip my lid, you know, Dan Siegel, Tina Bryson, Tina Payne Bryson, then I'm not, I'm not helping them. Um, and that's a high ask for parents who have kids who are hard. I get it. I get it. Um, but just to, to take it seriously, because not only is stress contagious, but calm is contagious. Turns out that's a mantra of the Navy SEALs. And I think of them as high-performing people under stressful jobs. So yeah, we can move that direction. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And, and I suspect that probably, well, you mentioned your daughter and you mentioned that she was diagnosed as autistic and that was, she was pretty late with her diagnosis, correct? Oh yeah. And so yeah. I'm wondering, both from your own personal experience and from your experience working with other families and understanding the school system, you know, for our neurodivergent kids, and you talk about that sensitivity and recognizing how that can be so influential and in how kids, whether or not they feel autonomy or how they're just regulating their emotions. Can we talk just for a little bit about what schools can do, aren't doing, should think about doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, part of, part of it is that, that um, using the word schools, um, I, I don't like to talk and in, in paint in broad Brush strokes, right? Of course. There are so many different types of schools. And even within a single school, there are going to be great educators for your kid. Yep. And they're going to be educators who are great for other kids, ideally, someone, <laughs> but, just not, <laughs> but just not for your kid. And so part of it is, you know, helping um, when my daughter was going, was really just having a lot of emotional struggle. One of the things that we would really try to spend time on it is where were her islands of of recovery, her islands of peace during the day? Who were the people who saw her, who got her? Because some people, we weren't going to change who they were and how they ran their class. We we weren't. So the best we could do is is have her have tools to cope. But again, but much like back to the rewards and things you look forward to, if she knew that I got to get through this guy, but then I got on to to this or that class and boy, she's so wonderful. And so it's um, kind of stress recovery, right? You know, you can get through a stressful period so long as you know this is where you can catch your breath. Um, and so that's a part of it. Um, certainly for, for at any age, but particularly for little guys, fighting homework that's not necessary. I was just down in a, a school in Atlanta giving a talk and some really great educators and this woman said, you know, I believe all this, you know, about how we, we know that homework contributes zero in, in kindergarten, elementary. And she said, but the parents want this and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I said, respectfully, I said, I would really encourage you to be courageous on behalf of these children and their developing brains, because you know stuff that their parents don't know. Now, and so I would really advocate and, 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 and really make the case for why you're not doing homework and why you have confidence they can develop all the skills they want and how they can do that in ways that aren't through homework and really advocate on behalf of what the science tells us. Because what all you really have to do there is make parents feel that it's safe not to be on their kids all the time and not to be burying them with homework when we know, Peter Gray, that the best thing you can possibly do for developing kids is love them unconditionally, make sure they get plenty of sleep and let them play mm. for goodness sakes. And so she was, so it was hard, right? It was, it was hard. But I would fight homework that is unnecessary. I would spend, you know, we talk about this in the book of helping kids develop self-understanding that, hey, your, your brain, you know, school wasn't designed for you. I mean, you can, read, you can read Todd Rose and realize that school wasn't really designed for anybody, but that's another issue. Um, but, but help them figure out how to navigate that. And also, you know, the serenity prayer to make peace with, there are some things you can't control, you know, and it sucks, and it sucks. Um, and at least if we can take their side emotionally, what a lot of times I see parents do, not really purposely or consciously, but the school is saying you got to do this or you got to do that. And it's really stressful to the parent if they feel like they're in trouble if their kid isn't doing this or that. And then the, the parent sort of tries to coerce the kid into doing something that may not be developmentally appropriate or at very least isn't working for them. And then the kid feels like emotionally their parent is on the, on, on the school side, right? Yeah. You know, and, and our, our thing, particularly for kids who are neurodivergent or having any kind of, any reason that school is hard, is you want home to be a safe base. Yeah. Full stop. And that's, uh, I mean, it's hard because if you, you worry so much if my kid isn't doing well, this, that, the other, I'll, I'll share. My daughter in the end of eighth grade, 
she'd had all these struggles, all things that are typical of girls as they're going through puberty and adolescence and middle school years. If you're ASD and you don't know it, she had no friends for three years. And we're, we're thinking, well, this year will be the next year. And this is a teacher. And, and no one could, and, and I could feel her stress. It just, it never dawned on me that this is what was going on because she didn't predict in typical ways, right? Yeah. And so when we were out for a walk this one time and my daughter, um, my daughter was, she was just, you know, everything, everything was hard and full school refusal for the last three months of eighth grade, right? Mm. And I say, I, we're out for a walk. I said, listen, I said, I know it, it sucks. Everything is hard. And I said, but you're going to have this great life. I said, you're, you're, you're super funny. Your creatives all get out. You're smart as a whip. You're going to do cool things in this world. You're going to find your friends and people. And it's going, to, it's, going to, it's going to be good. I'm confident of that. I never say no because, you know, God makes plans, right? And she looks at me and it just hears her. I said, it doesn't feel that way. And I know. It's like, I know it doesn't feel that way. But one of the things we talk about this idea of in a non-anxious presence is trying to take the long view because our fears are always about are that our kids will get stuck someplace and they'll never have friends and they'll never find their way and they'll never be successful. And when we're fearful that way, it makes it a lot more likely that kids get stuck in that kind of thinking as well. Bill and I were given a lecture um, local school and this mom stands up and she said, Bill worked with my kid when he was in whatever grade, seventh grade. She said he was the most learning disabled kid at a school for kids with learning disabilities. He's now in his third year at the University of Maryland doing blah, 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 whatever the heck it was, and just doing great. And particularly when we talk about the prefrontal cortex, the most helpful thing that anyone can know is how slow to develop is the prefrontal cortex. And so all these things of whether it's anxiety or whether it's ADHD, ASD, all these things that are hard can get better. And this is why as educators, as parents, we never, 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 never give up on a kid. And we do everything we can to not let them give up on themselves. Because if you looked at, I mean, if you looked at my daughter in eighth grade and you looked at her now, you, you couldn't believe it's the same person, you know? All the cool parts were there at the beginning and they're there now, but all the stuff that was hard, it's like... It went away. I mean, it didn't go away, but... Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It has been processed or, or, or shifted. It's been processed. She's figured out who she is. I mean, yeah. you know, the interesting thing that, that for me, one of the mo most powerful things, I'm forever grateful, by the way, if you haven't interviewed her yet, a woman named Donna Henderson who wrote this book called Is It Autism? Mm. And it's basically about what do we learn from the girls? You know, what do we learn from girls and women who have autism but don't have any obvious impairment? So they just fly under the radar. And it was so incredibly exculpatory to my daughter that all the things that were hard, there was a reason why. And she still had to fight with them, but she didn't have to beat herself up anymore. And we're sitting there doing the debrief. <laughs> I look over at Dr. Anderson. I said, you know, this is all so incredibly helpful. And I have to tell you, I feel like with what we now, it, it explains everything. Mm. And I feel like I'm sitting here at the end of the movie, The Sixth Sense, right? If you remember that movie, right? It's like, mm -hmm. wow. And so for me, the biggest thing for me, I'm, I'm slightly more extroverted than normal people are, I think. And my daughter would come home after a, a really hard day navigating school and she would hold it together and then she would retreat to her room. Well, the narrative in my head was that, oh, this poor kid, you know, and, and she's just gonna sit there and feel sad and lonely in her room, and I would try to pull her out to be more social. <laughs> and when someone explained to me finally what autistic burnout is, and, and, and that this was exactly what she needed, that surprise, surprise, her brain operated differently than my brain did, it one stopped me from thinking, why can't she, she, she would have, could have, whatever. And it also, so it let her off the hook, but also let me off the hook that it wasn't my job, you know, or even a good idea to try to figure out some way to draw her out of her room when being in her room and, and, and decompressing was exactly what she needed to do. So it's just been, it's been, it's been great, you know, and she goes to college and she's engaged socially and then she retreats with her you know, emotional support rabbit, which is a very cool animal, by the way, <laughs> um, and bounces back. And, and, and she, she know, she's learning how, we're back to that self-awareness, she has learned how 
to regulate her life and a world that wasn't really built for her, but she's figuring it out and, and just killing it. So I'm just, it's, it's glorious. Yeah. I love that. Well, Ned, I could sit here and talk to you all day. <laughs> but you don't do three-hour podcasts, so I'm guessing, so yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, well, and I don't know that people listen to three-hour podcasts either, but Ned Johnson, host of the Self-Driven Child podcast and author of the book by the same name, thank you so much for sharing today. Well, thank you, Emily. I'm so grateful for the work that you do because it is, uh, you know, raising kids, even kids where everything's going easy, isn't always easy. And for kids, for, for kids where things are hard, it's just, it's, it's tough. It's tough. And, um, you know, the knowledge that you bring to people, much like with my daughter, I think is so helpful. So people can stop beating themselves up and wondering so much and, and put their energy on the things where they actually can make a difference and keep those relationships with their kids at the, at the core of, of everything. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks. I remember in middle school trying to explain to one of my teachers how I resented being told what to do rather than being asked. Luckily, this was a teacher who got me, and this wasn't interpreted as rude or defiant. My 15-year-old has described how when he knows he needs to do something and then we remind him to do it, it makes him want to do it less. I think we can all connect with this relationship between motivation and autonomy. The question for us, as educators and parents, is how do we empower young people to use that autonomy to move toward their goals? The more we recognize what makes our kids tick, the better we'll be able to connect with them and help them connect with what drives them. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. thanks to Ned Johnson. You'll find links to his work in the show notes, so check it out. Also, I'm excited about the new year. We continue to hit milestones with our little podcast, and we have you to thank. If you would be so kind as to share us with a friend or coworker, we would be very grateful. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our office manager and social media director is Krista Brown. I'm the executive producer, Dave Morris. For all of us, thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.